Hi, and welcome to another edition of Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva. Well, we've got an interesting show for you today. We have a couple of topics that are always near and dear to me, music and photography. And we've got a gentleman who is a freelanced photographer based out of New York City, Joseph A. Rosen. Joseph has been on the scene for over three decades. His work has appeared in Time, Newsweek, The New York Times, Sports Illustrated, and more. In addition to a regular corporate and commercial work, his music clients Clients are among the greatest names in blues, jazz, RB, uh, soul, rock, Cajun, Zydeco, you name it, as well as record company management groups and music publications. Uh, Joe began uh, began photographing, oh my goodness, uh, over four decades ago. We'll get into that with him. He's got a brand new book called uh, Blues Hands, and uh, we welcome to Studio 411, uh, Joseph A. Rosen. Joe, how are you? I'm fine, uh, and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, tell me, um, uh, as I said, you've been you've been in the business for uh, uh, over four decades. I'm sure, in some ways, it seems like it was only yesterday. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, well, first of all uh, how you got into uh, this line of work. Well, uh, I my dad always had a great camera, and I always loved work. You know, was kind of fascinated by it. Then in high school, I did the high school yearbook, and I took pictures for the high school newspaper. And then when I got into college, I got into a program built around photography. Although I was in the humanities school, I did a lot of volunteer photography and studied with. Uh, design professors and fine art professors at Carnegie where I went to school and I was freelancing uh, small jobs before I graduated and uh, I'm, I'm a lot older than that now so I've had a, a long run at it and I've never done anything but photography for a living and I still have fun. And, and that's the key right there and, and still having fun after all these years. Uh, the book by the way Blues Hands, uh, Joseph A. Rosen, the author photographer uh, published by Schiffer Publications for more information josepharosen.com. Um, now, in the middle of all this hectic schedule that you're always under undertaking, I know you just got back from, uh, from a, a photography cruise, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, tell me, what, uh, what was the inspiration to, to, to take a few photos, about 100, uh, give or take a few, and, and put it into this, uh, into this book? Uh, well, I, first of all, I'm a fan of blues music, and uh, I also happen to be a professional photographer. And when I started, it was just um, casual. And um, I, would, uh, I started in, with my blues photography in 1976. I made a pilgrimage from Pittsburgh, where I was living, to Washington, D.C., to see Muddy Waters. Both shows, both nights, and quietly and politely, I shot with a, a Leica, and in those days, it was much more casual. You didn't need a credential. Um, you know, you could, if you were polite and respectful, uh, everybody was fine with it. So I started in 76 with that, and I've not stopped. I've kept shooting blues um, continuously since then. And now, of course, uh, uh, your first uh, foray as far as uh, pilgrimage, we'll call it, to see Muddy Waters. My goodness, you, you can't get much higher than that as far as uh, blues legends. No, and I'm glad that, uh, you know, getting old is one thing, but I'm glad I'm old enough that I got to see Muddy and John Lee Hooker when they were vital. You know, they weren't just uh, walking with a cane, and uh, they still, you know, had, had all their powers. And uh, I'm glad I got to photograph a lot of those guys and, you know, meet them and hang with them a little bit. I didn't get a chance to see Muddy. I was fortunate a, a couple of years ago, I think uh, PBS, I don't know where they found this, they, they found a... Uh, uh, a special or a concert that was put together where the Stones uh, showed up at some Chicago club and and I believe Muddy Waters showed up there and of course you know yeah. they were big idols of uh, you know uh, or big fans I should say of Muddy Waters and so that was pretty pretty neat to see him uh, not too many years removed from when you first saw him yeah. up on stage and uh, I've seen that and uh, it's a great historical moment, musically, maybe not so much. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know that the Stones were at their best. Maybe that's why it was kept under wraps for so long. But, Chaotic, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and disorganized. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, tell me about um, uh, influences in, in your photography. Was there someone growing up that, you know, you kind of looked at their, their work and said, hey, this is, uh, this is who I want to emulate? Or uh, was it more about the subject matter rather than any... Uh, it was certainly about, with the music stuff, about the subject matter, because 
like I say, I was a fan, but I was uh, like a sponge. I loved the, the greats, um, Henry Cartier-Bresson, Robert Frank, um, you know, a lot of the Life magazine was stuff, something I grew up with, you know, where pictures were, photographs were vital. Uh, it was, you know, different than uh, media saturation these days. And then there's one gentleman I met, uh, although I was in my 40s at the time, I was a pretty much fully formed photographer, but Herman Leonard, who was the dean of the jazz photographers, and uh, he and I became friends, and he was a mentor of sorts, uh, not so much technically, but just... Uh, uh, in uh, artistically, and my work in a certain way uh, echoes him. The uh, a lot of the black background and the subject emerging from the, the darkness. Um, he's a master, and anybody who is not familiar with his work should run right out and uh, Google Herman Leonard. <laughs> he's the best, and he was a wonderful human being, uh, regardless of uh, the photographs. He was just a good friend and a, a great guy. I owe him a lot. Now you mentioned Life magazine, of course. Life, I remember in, in its waning days, I know it came back for a brief time later on in the 80s, 80s or 90s, but uh, there was a magazine that even as a kid, and if you have the opportunity to even see some via YouTube or, or any uh, online site, I mean, the, the quality of uh, imagery in there, especially at, at all levels, but when it came to music or entertainment, was was beyond, uh, beyond reproach. Yeah. It, it was um, well. It was the the top of the pyramid, you know, the, the peak, uh, and it was in your house every uh, you know once a week with new photographs showing showing you the world. Now, what about uh, in terms of uh, you mentioned technique and and some things you learned along the way? Uh, what what's your favorite uh, uh, then? Maybe it's changed now. Uh, uh, color or black and white or or kind of uh, you you found that you've utilized both. I utilize both, uh, although a lot of my um, quote-unquote classic uh, images, you know, back with Muddy, uh, are black and white, and I kind of, I still love the the look of, you know, real stark black and white, but uh, I shoot everything, mm -hmm. and one of the beauties of the digital era is if you have a good workflow and good software and kind of know what you're doing, you can have good black and white and good color from the same image if you choose, so you can, go, you can make the call sometimes afterwards. And now how is, uh, from uh, the mid-70s to now, over the, the last 40 plus years, how have the, um, the technology and, and the uh, ease or difficulty, you tell me, in terms of, uh, obviously, uh, things were, were much more, um, uh, we're not going back to the box camera era, but obviously the equipment has certainly changed. Uh, some will tell you that uh, maybe not always improved as much as the old uh, old equipment. What's your take on it? I have half a career in the film world and the wet dark room and half a career in the digital world. Um, I just view them as different forms of capture. Um, I made the transition from film to digital cameras uh, pretty easily. I just, because uh, uh, I know how to work a camera. I've had one in my hands for a long time. Um, the big difference is the um, uh, people think digital is instant, and that's actually more time intensive. You spend more time uh, on the com almost as much time on the computer as you did shooting uh, to do the post production. Whereas with film, you either developed it yourself or um, dropped it off at the lab and picked it up the next day, and it was done. <laughs> There's a lot more time invested in digital. Plus, the cost with digital is um, upfront. You need to uh, you need uh, good cameras, you need good uh, computers, you need storage, um, whereas back in the day with films, you could get a good Leica or a good Nikon and use it for 10, 15, even 20 years. Um, the stuff, the digital cameras keep evolving, and every few years it, uh, it behooves you to upgrade. So. so it's like medicine. You're the doctor of photography. You always have to keep, uh, keep abreast of the latest trends and the latest uh, upgrades in equipment. Yeah, you have to keep current, particularly if you're making your living at it. You know, um, uh, you know, their expectations uh, rise with when the uh, equipment improves. People expect to see a, a, a certain level of uh, results and you know files and equipment and things like that. But that's part of the game. That's part of the business. Joseph A. Rosen joining us here for the hour on Studio Four One One. The book Blues Hands published by Schiffer Publications. For more information, josepharosen.com.
Com. And as you can see from the cover of the book, again, uh, pretty, pretty self-explanatory, uh, the, the music of blues and the hands, the hands that, uh, you know, featured on uh, whether it's a guitar or a trombone or whatever, or perhaps a, or a piano or even just holding the microphone. Uh, so uh, tell me now again, too, uh, when you came up with the idea, obviously, I'm sure you, as, as you've said, you have photos of Muddy Waters, but with these particular photos that go back uh, uh, over like three decades at least, uh, when did the idea hit you? Hey, you know, I've got, an, I've got a concept here that I like, you know, kind of show the way that these people, because I think sometimes people think musicians, ah, they don't work so hard, and who knows, they may even have other jobs besides what they did for a living at night. But again, I think that the concept of showing the hands of the, of the performer, of the artist, of the, uh, the technician in terms of a guitar and piano, I think that's a great, great idea. So uh, how did you, you know, come up with that idea? Um, I have a huge archive. As I said, it started in 1976 and has gone through the present. I mean, you know, hundreds of artists, thousands of images. And I was wanting to do a book of some sort, but I couldn't get my brain around the whole archive, the history of the world. Um, that's my next project. But uh, I was editing one day, uh, and I uh, came across two pictures, um, came up on the screen together uh, from a cruise, actually. And uh, I looked at them. One was Jimmy McCracklin um, with a lot of jewelry, and the other was uh, a bassist uh, where you don't see him. You just see the bass with a cigarette stuck in the head of the bass and the smoke curling up. And it just hit me, hands. I'm going to do hands now. And every photographer who shoots musicians occasionally shoots their hands. It's just a natural thing to do. But once I got the idea in my head, I would spend a few minutes of every show I shot looking for hands. And then as the project evolved, I, um, I found things in my archive that, um, that fit, fit the theme. The oldest picture in the book uh, is from 1982, and it's of Eubie Blake, the uh, ragtime pianist and composer. Um, he was well into his 90s uh, at that time, and I just, uh, you know, I'd taken a picture of his hand, and it looks like a bird or some, something. But, um, you know, uh, I found things that uh, carried the theme. And I, ha I should mention, and people will see when they look at the book and maybe see some of the images, that it's not just close-ups of hands. It involves gesture. It uh, can be hands wrapped around somebody uh, giving a hug, um, you know, hands waving in the air while musicians perform. Uh, so it's, it's more than just close-ups of hands. Uh, it's just the hands are a theme or a thread that run through it, the whole book. Uh, we're showing that picture of Yubi uh, Blake, and of course I remember Yubi because uh, when that whole thing in the early to mid '70s with the uh, Entertainer big hit record that uh, Marvin Hamlish uh, did, and of course it, it showcased, uh, I believe, Yubi playing on the piano, if I'm not mistaken, it was from a movie called The Sting, and then that whole genre of music kind of had a resurgence. And then here's Yubi, uh, at that point, my God, he had to be at least in his 80s, if not older. And then you look at his fingers, and I'm reminded, I never mastered the piano, never tried to, to be honest with you. But you look at his hands, and they always said, the longer your fingers, the better you are at a piano player. And I'm telling you, this looks like, uh, the fingers look like something out of Nosferatu. I mean, they are just like incredibly long fingers. Mm, yeah. Um, no, he was he was in a wheelchair, but he was smart and funny and salty, you know, cracking wise. Um, it was at a press conference for the uh, video disc for a, a Broadway musical called Yubi that was coming out. And of course, video discs went away, and so did he. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, tell me, musical influences in your life, and I, I think I have a scoop that um, one of them, uh, you spend quite a few hours uh, in your youth uh, listening to uh, a certain uh, jazz, uh, jazz legend, uh, Billie Holiday. Oh yeah, Billie Holiday um, is just a personal favorite of mine. Um, a picture of her done by my friend and mentor, Herman Leonard, hangs on my wall, and it's the front cover of one of his books, which I also did the jacket photo of, uh, Jazz Giants and Journeys. Um, Billy um, kind of brought the blues and jazz spheres into uh, into order for me, you know, they into harmony for me. Uh, and when I first discovered her music, I mean, I'd heard it and was kind of a little aware, but I first 
got into it deeply. Um, she refused to leave my turntable for about six months. I <laughs> just listened to everything I could find. Now, you know the story of uh, Billy Crystal, which I always found this amazing. I don't, uh, again, I don't know how it came about, but apparently in his youth, maybe from the age of six to 12, something in there, that she uh, must have known his, his parents later in her life, and she actually ba babysat Billy Crystal. I mean, can you imagine that, having uh, Billy Holiday as your babysitter? Yep, no, um, his dad, I think it was a Commodore label, but had a, a New York-based jazz label that recorded uh, Billy and many other people. So, yeah, they were all part of the scene. We're looking at a couple of shots here uh, on the monitor. Of course, the one on the left is uh, the one that's featured on the uh, book cover, a gentleman by the name of Willie King. Uh, tell us, uh, educate us, because again, a lot of these folks, some are with us, some may not, but again, they, they tend to be a little bit more obscure to some of the uh, uh, folks out there, uh, not as well known as B.B. King and, and many others. But uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Willie King and any experiences you had with him. Well, uh, Willie was an interesting guy. In addition to being a musician and a, a juke joint operator in Alabama, he was also a union organizer and a, a community activist. Uh, he studied at one point with Dr. King, and just a very interesting guy trying to help his community. But uh, he also had a pretty rough rural juke joint in Alabama. Um, but he gained some notoriety or more national and even international notoriety toward the end of his life. And, uh, you know, um, he, was, he was just a very nice guy, a very smart, sharp guy, and, um, you know, very real. You know, there's no, no phoniness about a guy like Willie. We've got a photo uh, that uh, I wanted to talk about. I thought it was a great shot, uh, a photo of, let's see, th uh, three of you. Uh, you as a young man on the left, uh, a phenomenal uh, blues uh, performer, Albert Collins in the middle. And uh, tell us not only about that shot, but also the, uh, the gentleman on the right. Well, the gentleman on the right was a dear friend of mine who's no longer with us, uh, Big Al Smith. And he and I were the uh, two blues DJs on a radio station, WYEP in Pittsburgh, which at the time was a pretty uh, small kind of uh, community-oriented radio station. Now it's much more established, uh, NPR, and, uh, but it was in a run in a basement below a garage in uh, the Oakland neighborhood of Pittsburgh. But if you were on the other end of the radio, it sounded just fine. And, uh, you know, um, Albert was coming through um, Pittsburgh, uh, touring behind his first kind of rediscovery, if you want to use that term. Uh, he'd had a great career in the 60s and kind of dropped off the scene, played locally, and then he signed with Alligator Records out of Chicago and had a big resurgence in his career, which carried on until he passed, I think, in the early 90s. But this was his first tour uh, after he'd signed with Alligator and um, one of the fiercest, most uh, intense blues bands. And sound. He had a unique sound. Um, of any artist I've heard. And he's just, a, again, a very nice guy. You know, people who've uh, made their life on the road and everything, they they, they know how to get along. And uh, they don't suffer fools easily, but uh, uh, if you're uh, friendly and respectful and they, they know you know a little bit about the music, uh, they're very open. So. Now, something you just said uh, reminded me to ask this question. Um, maybe an easy question, maybe not so easy, uh, but I, I would like to know the answer. In your opinion, um, blues obviously permeates all, all facets of uh, the country, and I'm sure the world, but w in what parts of the country, north, south, east, west, if it's a fair question to ask, do you think that blues is uh, most popular, and uh, uh, which area would you say of the country maybe not, not so much? Well, I mean, blues is everywhere, but it, 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 you know, its roots go down to the deep south um, and uh, Mississippi, in particular. And I'm not a historian, so I don't want to speak with a lot of authority. But uh, I'm not an ethnomusicologist. Uh, but um, it's gone to all parts of the world and all parts of the country. Um, you know, I would say probably the Northeast, you know, doesn't have as much of a scene, but uh, it's there, and there was always recording going on here. Uh, but as part of the culture, it's more a uh, southern thing. And, you know, it migrated from Texas to Los Angeles and from Mississippi to Chicago uh, and, you know, uh, points north. 
but uh, it's everywhere. And uh, but I'd say down south, like Memphis, you know, you'll go into an elevator and hear soul music. <laughs> there you go. That's ele that's a good elevator music for Market sure. And things like that, you know. Uh, you mentioned before we were talking about Albert Collins. You were talking about Alligator Records. I was reminded of uh, Rounder Records, probably Chess Records. Um, give me some other labels that, like when you were growing up, that I mean, really Chess was one of the original labels that first recorded uh, Electric Blues. And, uh, you know, that was Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and many, many others. Uh, they were out of Chicago, and they, they were in the first wave of, you know, well, late, starting in the late 40s, 50s, 60s of re uh, recording electric blues. Labels like Alligator and Rounder came on a little later, maybe in the 70s, 80s, uh, and recorded some of the same artists, but in the latter parts of their career. And kept their, you know, helped them uh, keep working and keep going. And isn't it interesting, and I agree with you, yeah, Chess really was uh, the forerunner out, uh, out of Chicago. Isn't it interesting how, um, and I saw this even in a movie, uh, it was a movie uh, based on the life of John Lennon, and how records, uh, whether it was soul, R&B, but even blues, you know, somehow found its way uh, across the ocean to, you know, uh, the United Kingdom, England, uh, in this case, and again, you know, Muddy Waters and uh, Howlin' Wolf and Screamin' Jay Hawkins. I mean, some obviously bordering a little bit more on what became rock and roll, but yep. obviously these records are what, you know, bands like uh, Eric Burden and the Animals, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, this is what influenced that, that whole generation over there in, uh, in Britain. It's very true, and they brought it back to America, made, made a lot of American youth become aware of it. Indeed. Joseph A. Rosen joining us for the hour here on Studio 411. The book, Blues Hands, published by Schiffer Publications. For more information, josepharosen.com. I don't have a photo of it. I'll hold it up for the camera. This gentleman here on the left, I was pleased to see him there. Of course, uh, the uh, influential and legendary late Les Paul. Uh, uh, tell me uh, about your encounters with, uh, with Mr. Paul. Well, I actually shot that on assignment for the New York Times uh, on the occasion of Les's 80th birthday. They were doing a feature on him, and I went out to his home at home slash home studio in uh, Mawa, New Jersey, just across the river from New York City. And um, at the time, he had all of his inventions uh, were still there. Now I believe they're in the Gibson Museum uh, and elsewhere. Uh, so um, he was very genial. We had a great time, and I have pictures of him. He, the picture you're looking at is Les Paul holding the guitar that's named after him, mm -hmm. Les Paul. So it's Les Paul with a Les Paul. And uh, I have pictures of him with the first solid body guitar, which is called the log or the plank. It was a 4x4 four four that he put pickups on. Uh, pictures of him with the original sound on sound tape deck. He was an innovator and an inventor in addition to a great musician. And that was a great afternoon. I had a wonderful time with him. And uh, one of the pictures of Les posed in front of a, he had a larger than life size picture of himself when he was 15. So um, I asked him if he would kindly uh, pose in front of that, Les Paul 80, Les Paul when he was 15. That ran like uh, half a page on the front of the arts and leisure section. I, I remember seeing that, yeah, that was, that was a great shot. He had a hat on in the uh, the younger picture. And, and right, a straw hat. Yeah, he was, yeah. he was, I, he was from Wisconsin. I believe he was billed as Walkasaw Red at that time. <laughs> and he lives on, I just heard recently his name mentioned, and I did not know this. I don't know that you knew this. I don't know how the connection was made, but apparently uh, the uh, the great uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer and, and dabbled in a little kind of blues himself. He was exposed to it a little bit. I can see why now. Uh, Steve Miller, many of you know from the Steve Miller Band, who, of course, uh, is still out there well into his 70s. And what I was amazed to find out recently was that his godfather was Les Paul. Yes, they, they had a, uh, I think Steve's family had a relationship with Les, and I think he took lessons from him when he was a youngster. There you go. And I can remember uh, uh, in the mid to late 60s before he really hit it big with, with the, the music like The Joker and Fly Like an Eagle, that his music was a little bit more uh, kind of blues oriented and also a gentleman that played in his band for a brief time, Boz Skaggs, another guy that 
kind of has a little bit of that blues sound in my ear anyway, and he was a member for a brief time of the Steve Miller Band. So I just was amazed when I heard that. I said, well, that's Paul. That is your godfather. That, that's... If I ever meet Steve, I had the first question I would ask him, tell me about Les Paul. I thought that, that was great. Uh, I was telling Joe, I didn't give it away, but I said, well, I'll let Joe tell me whether I, I get a C or an A plus or whatever. I, looking through this book, uh, Blue's Hands, I was, I guess, impressed that out of the hundred or so shots that I actually have seen five of these individuals uh, and or bands play, and I'll, I'll go through them. Uh, Kim Wilson, who's in the book, of course, uh, a well-known singer uh, for, uh, for the uh, fabulous Thunderbirds. Yeah. Um, I was at a benefit not long ago and saw a gentleman named Joe Lewis Walker came on stage, and he's in the book. Um, a guy that uh, a guy that was um, the opening act uh, in 2019 when I saw the Rolling Stones for the first time guy named uh, Gary Clark Jr., very uh, talented young man. Um, God, this one goes back to like 1977. Uh, went to a Peter Frampton concert. Uh, there were three bands. Uh, the first band, who was it? The Elvin Bishop Band. And Elvin Bishop's in this book, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer from his days with the uh, Paul Butterfield Blues Band. Back on Studio 411 with our guest Joseph A. Rosen, the book Blues Hands, published by Schiffer Publishing. And for more information, www.josepharosen.com. We've got a photograph here to my left. Uh, at first I thought, well, maybe it's like Ray Charles or somebody. Uh, I see the keyboard, the black and white ivories, and I see this pair of hands. I thought at first it was two different individuals, but I guess it's the same person, maybe with their hands uh, crossed. Uh, turned out it's a photo you took of uh, 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 Zydeco legend, uh, Cajun legend, Buckwheat Zydeco. Uh, yes, um, um, Buckwheat uh, Stanley Durrell Jr., uh, Buck, AKA Buckwheat Zydeco, was a good friend of mine. Um, he was a Creole musician. He, he always wanted to make that very clear. Uh, Cajun was a little different thing. He's from a different culture. Uh, but he's playing organ there, and his hands are crossed over left to right. And he told me, uh, when organ players do that, that's called going cross-country. <laughs> okay. So I was correct. I'm looking. I'm saying based on the uh, the angle of the wrist, I said either either he's double or triple jointed or I don't know what. So, okay, there you go. And, but, you know, to get a certain chord or... Uh, now, was that, was that a, he was playing an organ? So, because when I saw that it was him, I thought, well, I knew him, uh, I had seen him on the, the old David Letterman show back in the 80s. That was my first exposure. And I loved his music, but I did not realize that, uh, that uh, you know, besides that, he played uh, keyboards as well, which should be He was originally a keyboard player, and then when he got more involved, in the, uh, uh, became an ambassador for the Creole country, uh, culture, he, um, he decided to learn the accordion, which was uh, Zydeco music, which was the music of his, his parents and earlier generations. And he, um, he saw Bob Marley when he was working as a keyboardist for Clifton Engineer, and he realized that he wanted to bring, out that, uh, bring that culture further forward. So he went and probably took off took off for about a year and learned the accordion but his, his first history was as a keyboardist um and then he you know he took off from there he's the first zydeco artist to uh sign to a major label island records oh so again island of course another label that, that got into it as well very good um joe has received the uh, prestigious keeping the blues alive in photography and artwork back in 2002 uh, presented by the Blues Foundation to an artist who has created a body of work that has brought the blues to the public and made a significant contribution to the blues world. And am I correct, a few years ago, did you not get elected into the, uh, uh, was it called, the New York City Blues Hall of Fame? Yes, I was. Uh, there, uh, it, it's an organization that honors uh, uh, folks in different region, regions. There's the Blues Hall of Fame uh, sponsored by the Blues Foundation in Memphis, which uh, is more historical and has a panel of scholars and experts that uh, honors people. And then this uh, other organization, the Hall of Fame, I believe they're based in California, gives out um, uh, uh, 
uh, recognition to more regional artists and local artists and people who are in the trenches and making the scene happen. But yes, uh, four or five years ago, uh, a guy named Michael Packer, who represented them, uh, put me up for that. And it was Very nice. Honor. We got off track here when I was showing the uh, photo from the book of Willie King. Uh, to the right of it um, is a uh, trombone player, a gentleman named Willie Trombone Shorty. Tell me a little bit about Mr. Uh, Mr. Trombone Shorty. Okay, Trombone Shorty got the nickname because he started out as a, a child prodigy, five and six years old. Uh, he's now very successful, uh, travels the world. Uh, with his band Trombone Shorty uh, and Orleans Avenue. They're out of New Orleans and play a mix of traditional and more modern stuff. They're very popular in the jam band world. And part of what the book is about, or the pictures in the book, are how there's two per, one per page facing each other, um, the juxtaposition of the two photos and how they play off each other. So the first photo is Willie King playing a very worn guitar, uh, you know, kind of, um, you know, you can tell it's it's it's, it's been, been around for a long time and worn down and his hands are rough. And the second picture is uh, Trombone Shorty, a young man uh, with a shiny instrument. So it's old and worn, young and shiny, playing off of each other. And um, that's kind of the idea, the juxtaposition. I should add, too, that um, in the back of the book, I wrote um, brief but a hopefully informative uh, anecdotal and biographical information about each of the artists because I didn't want it to be just a blues nerd book just for people who uh, you know, knew about blues or were fans of blues. Uh, I wanted to spread the information, uh, let people know who these artists are and where they can find more information about them. Uh, and also just to enjoy it, uh, first as the photographs, but also to get some uh, a background on the artists. Indeed. Yeah, I found that very useful because even someone like myself who, of course, has spent, uh, you know, all his life, uh, you know, enjoying and learning about music, then, as I said, there are some that are not as readily familiar to myself and, and I'm sure uh, uh, others, uh, perhaps uh, more novices to the uh, genre or genres. And then, of course, I thought that was great. Gives a little background, uh, awards they've received, what they're known for, et cetera, et cetera. So a very good indeed. Um, let's see now. We have uh, in 2019, we, we lost uh, or have lost uh, a few people. Uh, Dave Bartholomew of uh, Fats Domino, Alan Toussaint, uh, Dr. John. What, uh, these are people that, of course, you photographed. Uh, some appear in this book, some do not, but I know you photographed them. What struck me as uh, unusual was of those four that I remembered and know of just in 2019 alone, uh, how interesting that they were all from that kind of New Orleans, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, Mississippi uh, area. Those uh, those four were at the core of New Orleans rhythm and blues, um, you know, um, and it was uh, well, it was kind of tragic and shocking that they all went down so close to each other. That was the end of an era for sure. Indeed, and, and uh, Dave Bartholomew, for those of you that say the name sounds familiar, uh, co-wrote and wrote a lot of the material that Fats Domino did and wrote for others as well, lived to the uh, ripe old age of uh, 100 on the nose. And, uh, of course, Fats Domino, uh, well into his 80s and uh, even after the uh, um, tragedy that uh, you know befell uh, Louisiana in general, New Orleans area, especially with uh, Katrina back in uh, 2005, uh, uh, hung on for another 10 or 12 years and uh, love his music. I can remember as a young adult coming across one of those bargain bins of CDs and saying, wow, you know, I found this like one disc and I could see that it was from an anthology of Fats Domino music. And I said, oh, this is like disc three. I said, oh, too bad. Next thing you know, I'm digging. I find number two, number one, number four. Next thing I realized, I had the whole anthology for, for, for you know, uh, probably one-tenth of what the original, uh, uh, you know, collection would have cost me had I bought it, uh, you know, all, all packaged together. Yeah. <laughs> good, good stuff, uh, good stuff. Bartholomew was a major force. I mean, he, he produced all those Fats Domino hits and Little Richard and many of the New Orleans artists. He was kind of the uh, he was a band leader and kind of the man behind the scene making it happen. Got another photograph here. Again, another gentleman with, uh, with uh, very uh, thin, uh, long fingers, uh, the late, great uh, Johnny Winter. 
Uh, tell me about your encounters with him and uh, a little about this photograph we have. Well, uh, I mean, I saw Johnny Winter at the Fillmore East uh, when I was a teenager, and, you know, he was a big rock star. And one of my uh, entrees into the blues, you know, his early albums were, were very, very uh, bluesy and uh, led you know, led me into the deep water of the blues. One reason I made sure to include him is he was a longtime Connecticut resident. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, uh, he carried on until uh, he was 70, um, and it, he had a history of uh, substance abuse. But in his latter years, uh, with the help of his band leader, Paul Nelson, he was clean and getting healthy and, unfortunately, uh, you know, rising up uh, in a, his career was... Uh, elevating again, and then of course he passed away very suddenly. Um, one thing uh, about that photo is Johnny sometimes played a guitar with the tuning pegs on the bottom, and you see a little glow on the top of the guitar, and that's a uh, happy accident. That's not Photoshop, that's nothing. That was a spotlight hitting the uh, metal at the top of the guitar, creating a glow. So I always like that. Now, uh, who out there today, in your opinion, uh, whether they might have made this book or not, but that is kind of carrying on the uh, the blues music tradition? I know we mentioned Gary Clark. He might be one. Uh, there's a couple of others, but uh, in the book that uh, I got the impression you feel they're, they're kind of the rising stars of, of today's blues I mean, there's music. a good friend of mine who is in the book, Ronnie Earl, who's played around New England with Room Full of Blues and uh, Sugar Ray and the Blue Tones for many years, Duke Robillard. Uh, also of Room Full of Blues history and, you know, solo career. And then there's a lot of uh, younger players coming up. Uh, I tend to, uh, you know, I find some of the players who are billed as blues players are really a little more in the rock vein, but that's just my taste. I, I prefer a little more uh, straight ahead, not not uh, flashy guitar, but uh, musical guitar. Um, so... There's, there's a lot of good young players out there. They don't necessarily get all the recognition, but uh, there, there are people coming up. Yep. A lot of good young African-American players, too. We're starting to make some noise. We've got a, a young lady here that uh, I believe is still with us, uh, Maxine uh, Brown. Um, I seem to recall she had a big hit on the charts, and I just could not... Uh, think of what it was, but tell me a little bit about Maxine. She uh, Well, Maxine is still with us. I don't know if she's performing all that much. She had her first hits in the early 60s, Oh No, Not My Baby, and uh, a couple others. She's a very elegant lady, and um, the photo, I don't know if you're showing it, but yes. uh, it was done in a studio, and um, <clears throat> a photo studio where I lit it, and it's juxtaposed with a, a gentleman, Chuck Jackson, who was also very elegant. He's in a tuxedo. They did what I would call uptown soul, um, and they were some of the first people to uh, sing Back Rack David uh, songs uh, in, a, in a soul vein. And um, they're juxtaposed because they did duets together, and both photos are very similar, you know, black background, uh, figure emerging out of the darkness. Um, so Maxine is still around. I don't think she performs all that much anymore, but uh, great lady, wonderful, uh, wonderful vocalist. And you mentioned Chuck Jackson. I just heard a version of one of his big hits. I, I don't remember if it was a Bacharach David, but uh, I heard Ronnie Millsap's version of Any Day Now. And then I remember seeing a special not long ago on uh, either Backrack or Hal David, uh, who worked together for many years, and there was uh, a performance of Chuck Jackson. So again, Chuck, uh, you know, didn't always get the exposure that he should have gotten, but but certainly a, a fine talent in his own right. Yes, and, and I believe he's still working. Uh, again, probably not as often as he used to, and you know, he's earned his retirement. Greatest blues musician, or well, uh, let's say, give me three and make it easy. I know sometimes it's tough when you just try to narrow it down to one. In your lifetime as a, well, broaden it, as a a, uh, a witness, just as a, 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 a photographer or as someone just sitting in the audience or backstage watching, uh, three greatest blues performers slash musicians in your lifetime that you've witnessed. Well, I mean, if it's just just three. I mean, I'd have to say Muddy, Muddy Waters, uh, B.B. King, and Albert King. Albert King was just something to behold. Um, one note, and 
<laughs> it was over with him. He was just uh, one speed forward. And uh, I have shows that I remember very dearly about of seeing Albert King perform. And we were talking earlier about uh, Elvin Bishop. Now, obviously, I was I was impressed with him as a guitarist. Again, uh, what did you think? Or he's still very much uh, around with us today. But what did you think of him when you first saw him perform? Well, I first saw him perform with the Butterfield Band, not not the very original band, but a somewhat later incarnation after Mike Bloomfield left them. But I saw them many times. And Elvin's become a friend through the cruises and everything. Uh, He's a great guitar player. He's a great songwriter, often with a lot of humor in his in his songs, and he's just a really, really sweet guy. Um, I look forward to spending any time I can with him. And you were talking about uh, the cruises. Uh, uh, give me an example, like this most recent one that you've been on. Uh, kind of give me an, an example of uh, some of the folks that. Uh, were on that cruise that you had a chance to spend some on time with? last one, it's called the Legendary Rhythm and Blues Cruise, and it goes twice a year. Um, let's see, on this last one, Taj Mahal was the headliner. Uh, Keb Mo was on, uh, Los Lobos. Uh, not a pure blues band, but a great rocking, rootsy mm -hmm. band uh, um, with a lot of uh, Hispanic, Mexican influences, uh, plus regional national artists like Tommy Castro, um, Oh, I don't know. There's, there's something like 25 bands or 25 acts from bands to solo artists. Uh, I've seen, you know, Kim, Charlie, Muscle White. Um, it, you know, it, there's a lot of music on the boat. But this last one, Taj Mahal, Kev Mo, and Los Lobos were the headliners. Uh, a photo that we don't have to show, but I wanted to ask, as uh, of course you uh, photographed him, I always thought it was an interesting um, way he had to play the guitar, the legendary Richie Havens. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, well, tell me about him. Any idea where he got that technique of kind of, he used to grip the, the, uh, the neck of the guitar in a, a way that I've never seen anybody play before. I, I don't know much about his technique, uh, but I've met him a few times. Uh, we, we had the same attorney, <laughs> who's also a friend of both of ours. There uh, you go. He was just a very sweet gentleman, and uh, you know, one of my early favorites, uh, you know, out of the Woodstock era. And uh, I saw him as a teenager in Greenwich Village and things like that. Very sweet guy. Now, you bring up, uh, obviously, uh, growing up in, in the city as a teenager. Uh, take me back to those times. I always hear, oh, there was a lot more, you know, club activity than there is now or the last 20 years. Uh, obviously, some of the, the clubs that I'm sure you frequented probably aren't around anymore. Kind of paint us a picture of some of the, uh, some of the, the musical venues, uh, blues or otherwise, club-wise, that, that were around back in the day in New York. <laughs> uh, I mean, okay. When I was in high school, the big thing to do on the weekends was go to the Fillmore East. And it almost didn't matter who was playing. Where are you, what are you doing this Friday or Saturday? Going to the Fillmore. And they always had very eclectic uh, bills. It could be a jazz band with a rock band with a blues band. Uh, so I got exposed to a lot of stuff. I saw Sam and Dave early on uh, there, which really opened my eyes. Uh, I saw B.B. and Albert there, uh, a, lot, a lot of different things. I didn't do a lot of clubbing because I was underage. Uh, and but I do remember that I snuck into the village gate, uh, and the drinking age was 18 then, <laughs> uh, underage to see BB King. So, uh, you know, I was probably 16 or 17, and uh, you know, the, things were a lot more lax then too. They didn't, you know, if you were coming in spending a little money, as long as you were behaved well, you know, they kind of looked the other way. There you go. Did you ever have a time where, I mean, because obviously you, you had credentials uh, uh, more so than sometimes other photographers. We had a gentleman on uh, not long ago, uh, Julian David Stone, who put together a, uh, a terrific book of uh, people that he photographed in the late 70s through the 80s, later became a, a filmmaker, but still has a, a love and has a tremendous, again, old school camera archive of, of people that were performers in the 70s and 80s, especially from the, the rock uh, genre. But um, he told some great stories about sometimes having to smuggle equipment in. Was that ever a case where you were denied entry or denied the, uh, no, no, no photographs, and then you said, well. Um, well, basically, you know, um Basically, like I said earlier, uh, a lot of times if you were polite and, you know, I mean, I used, in a lot of the clubs I used very quiet cameras back in the film days, they were Leicas, which make virtually no noise. And you're respectful, it wasn't a big deal. Um, you know, 
if a club has a policy of no photos, that's their policy. I don't try and sneak around. Plus, you'll get caught. Right, right. Um, and then you'll get asked to leave. So I wanted to hear the music. Um, so And nowadays, uh, I go where I'm welcome. And most blues venues, I have... I, uh, you know, some connection. Uh, I work for a lot of music-related publications, so, you know, if, if there's a, a story or an artist, it's it's clear through the editors and through the PR people. You do need to get, you know, at festivals and um, other venues. Uh, it's not as casual as it used to be. You have to be cleared, although you can still take a camera into a club, and if you're polite um, and unobtrusive, uh, it works. Yeah, indeed. Got a photo here of a gentleman. I, uh, to me, th this photo, um, I love the Willie King one, but this one here, to me, could almost have been as much as uh, a cover, except he's not necessarily playing a guitar that I can see. You got a, a picture of a friend, a good friend of yours, uh, Frank Scrap Iron Robinson. Just love the the hands and, of course, the jewelry there. I just think, man, you, you can't get many more rings on that finger. Yeah, that's in the bling section of the book because a lot of the artists... Uh, you know, do wear a lot of jewelry, uh, at least on stage. You know, it's part of part of the persona. Uh, Frank is a good friend. Uh, he was on he MCs shows on the, uh, the legendary rhythm and blues cruise, and he was road manager for uh, a great blues artist, Little Milton Campbell, for over 30 years, and um, that meant uh, watching the door, watching the money, watching Milton's back, and. Um, Frank's got some good stories to tell, and he's a, he's a, a good friend and a really sweet guy. Um, and I just, uh, I was uh, doing hands at that point. I was conscious of shooting hands, and I said, hey, Scrap, hold it, let me see your rings. And he held up his hands and two frames, and bang, bang. Here in the remaining moments on Studio 411 with our guest, Joseph A. Rosen, a photographer and author of Blues Hands. It's such a good book that, that I keep uh, seeing images that aren't even in the book, but... <laughs> That's how good a book it is, I gotta tell you. Published by Schiffer Publications uh, for more information and, and maybe more photos that, that I have imagined that I saw, josepharosen.com. All righty, oh my goodness. Um, let's see, uh, there, there's a young lady you feature in the book, um, Samantha Fish. Again, another example of kind of a uh, up and coming uh, blues uh, performer in, uh, within the last two decades. Yes, I mean, Samantha made a big splash in the last uh, five or six years. Uh, I photographed her uh, er very early in her career when she was about 20. Um, I've done magazine covers of her. Uh, smart, talented young lady. She plays, um, you know, kind of a rock and blues, but uh, I've kind of watched her career evolve, and she's doing very well for herself uh, these days, and uh, she deserves it. She works hard, and she has the talent, and she's just also very beautiful. Now, as we just spoke earlier, obviously the, the book tries to, has the, the theme of hands, as you said, whether it's in hugging or, uh, or performing or clutching the microphone or the keyboard or the, uh, the um, uh, trombone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, are there photographs that, uh, again, I'm sure the answer is gonna be yes, that you wished you could have used, like give me like one or two people uh, besides Muddy, where you said, you know, it's too bad I didn't have like a tighter shot of their hand to feature in this book. Yeah, um, well, I tried to, you know, um, there's a couple, like for instance, I got Alan Toussaint is in the book, but like six months after it came out, I got what I consider, <laughs> a, I mean, I love the picture in the book, but I got one that was just uh, a real, uh, a home run. Uh, so you know, I wish I'd gotten the second picture of Alan in the book, not the not the first one. Um, I, there's a lot of people I would like to have gotten in the book, but I went with the best hands pictures. Uh, I'll also mention that uh, all the pictures are uh, straight out of the camera. They're full frame, uncropped, except for three: U.B. Blake, Ronnie Earl, and Shamika Copeland, uh, and they're just squared off a little bit from the usual uh, rectangular format. Uh, so uh, I didn't go in and crop hands out uh, of a, a particular frame. I, I either had a photo that uh, filled the bill or I, uh, I created some with, uh, but in the camera, basically. Now, during your long uh, uh, photogra uh, uh, photographic career, uh, are, is there any one or two artists that stand out uh, that you were never able to uh, either get permission to take a photo of or just were very 
much kind of against, you know, having their photograph taken? Uh, well, again, um, uh, I go pretty much these days where I'm welcome, and mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I have pretty good entree through my long you know, connections and career. I saw Helen Wolf, uh, who was one of my favorite blues artists from the Chess label, but it was toward the end of his life, and I never got to, I only saw him once, and I wasn't actively photographing blues artists at that point. I would have loved to have seen him and photographed him in his prime, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who were gone before I got into it, so. Indeed. We've got a quote, I think, that uh, sums it up best from a gentleman named Dick Waterman. He's a photographer, author, also a fellow member of the Blues Foundation Hall of Fame, uh, has managed uh, several performers, uh, John Hurt, Buddy Guy, Bonnie Raitt, other blues artists. Uh, quote, Joe Rosen knows how to set up a photograph and then close the deal at just the right instant. Neither of these qualities can be bought or downloaded. It takes experience, true, but primarily it is an innate creativity to see the unseen, to move beyond the obvious, and to bring forth an image that is brilliant today and timeless for the memory. That's a quote from your friend uh, Dick Waterman. I think uh, speaks volumes of not only this book, but the, uh, the fine work that you do. Well, thank you. Dick is a good friend, um, and he was very kind to me. I should mention that Dick is in the Hall of Fame from the Blues Foundation of Memphis, Tennessee, while I was given from the other Hall of Fame a regional award, just just to be clear on that. Uh, you know, if I live long enough, I mean, who knows? <laughs> Maybe I'll get into both. <laughs> the book Blues Hands, uh, photographer, author Joseph A. Rosen, published by uh, Schiffer Publications. Uh, www.josepharosen.com. Uh, Joe, uh, uh, tell me, uh, what happens if I go to that site? What can I get? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, uh, there's a store page where you can order the book, uh, and they, all the books off of my website are signed, and there's a prompt if you want an inscription made out to, you know, mom or, you know, your husband or something. Uh, you know, there's uh, a, pl a prompt for all of that. And, um, you know, they go out by media mail and take a few days to be delivered, but uh, I, I do the fulfillment myself. And it's also available through uh, Amazon and all major booksellers. Those copies are not signed, though. Thank very you. good, very good. We thank you for joining us. We're going to leave with a shot uh, of uh, that's in the book as, uh, as you will see it in the book. A great shot of a couple of other uh, rock and roll uh, Hall of Famers, uh, R&B, Soul, you name it, they've done it all. Al Green and James Brown. Uh, we'll uh, put that photo up, and we thank you for joining us here on Studio 4. Thank you, Larry, for having me. Thank you, and uh, hang in there with us, and we thank you uh, folks out there for joining us as well here on Studio 411. Larry DeSilva is my name. We look forward to seeing you again next time. Take care.